The Ben Heck Show is brought to you by Element 14, the electronic design community where you can connect and collaborate with top engineers from around the world. Join now at element14.com. Hello, and welcome to the Felix Gardner Show. In today's episode, we're going to discuss switching to a technology-based diet. Rather than your morning routine of bacon and eggs for breakfast, we're going to have a floppy sandwich. Now, what we do is we take our locally sourced whole grain wheat bread and we get an old Elon Musk zip disk and a floppy disk, put our bread on there, and it adds up to 101.44 megabytes of deliciousness. Felix, what are you doing? I'm doing my show, Ben. Eating floppy disks? I mean, there's a Culver's like two blocks from here. Yeah, what do you suggest? Well, maybe instead of doing an episode about digesting electronics and probably killing yourself in the process, what if we talked about something that we don't usually cover on the show? Batteries. Hey, batteries. That's a great idea. Yeah, we're always putting them into projects, but we never talk about the batteries themselves. We could do an episode where we talk about the types of batteries, the pros and cons, the differences, how to charge them, and what to look out for. Excellent. Let's get started. Amazing hacks. How can we make this portable? Inspire designs. I am the internet troll. Regrettable acting. Them hatches. Each week, Element 14's The Ben Heck Show brings you innovative projects using electronics, engineering, and more. Before we get started looking at batteries, let's talk about some common battery terms. Voltage is the difference in potential between two points. The two points being the positive and negative terminals of your battery. It's not just about how much voltage your project takes, but how much overhead you need for your voltage regulators. If you have a regulator that takes a higher voltage, like seven volts and drops it down to five volts, it has something called a dropout voltage, which is the point at which the voltage will no longer work with the regulator. So you might have seven coming in and five coming out. You might think, oh, I can go all the way down to nearly five and it'll still output five. Well, if it's a standard linear regulator, no. There's actually a dropout voltage, usually around six or 6.5 volts, and it will stop working at that point. So you need more voltage potential past that, so it takes longer to drop to the point where it won't work. Of course, you can use efficient switching regulators to lessen that problem, but it is still there. At a certain point, it will fail. MAH means milliamp hour. That is how many milliamps of power the battery can provide for one hour. So if it's a 1,000 milliamp hour battery, you can provide 1,000 milliamps for one hour. But typically you can't discharge it that quickly. You might have 100 milliamps, in which case you would get 10 hours of battery life out of it. But even then you wanna kind of err on the side of caution and say, eh, I'll probably only get 80% of that. So if you're like, okay, I've got a 2,000 milliamp hour battery, my application is 250 milliamps, so you'd say, okay, eight hours, but mm, probably at least six. You might also find a C rating on a battery, especially a newer high capacity lithium ion polymer battery. That is a rate of charge or discharge. And typically for the battery, it's going to be about discharge. So the C rating tells you how many amps of power you can continuously discharge from the battery, although it's not a direct correlation. So if it's a 2000 milliamp hour battery, you take 2000, turn it into two amps, multiply it by the C rating, let's say it's 10, which means you could have 20 amps of continuous power. So for things like quadcopters or you know robotic application, you could possibly use that much energy in, in short bursts. Obviously the battery is not gonna last very long at that rate, but these high capacity batteries give you that number so you know what the battery is capable of. The first type of battery we're gonna talk about are standard alkaline batteries. That would include your lantern batteries, six volt, 1.5 volt AAs, 1.5 volt AAAs, nine volts, of course, and also coin cell batteries, although sometimes these are lithium technology, but still non-rechargeable. These give you three volts. So what you do with the project is you think about the voltage you need, and then you put the batteries in series to get the voltage you need, and then you put them in parallel to get the amperage you need. Also, I've heard that there's batteries inside of this. Let's find out. Yeah, this one's kind of dead. Before we do some battery examples, let's saw this thing open and see what's inside.
alkaline batteries, pros and cons. Pro, very common and easy to find. You can't get a LiPo at your corner gas station, but they will have double A's. But at what price? Decent power for the size. You put enough of them in series, you can get a lot of volts. You put enough of them in parallel, you can get a lot of amperage. There are many battery pack sizes available. So if you want to put it like two in a row or two side by side or four in a brick, there's all sorts of holders available online at Element 14. And they're great when size isn't a concern. So if you're building something that doesn't have to be super small, go ahead and use alkalines because they're very easy to implement. Cons, fairly expensive for a one shot use. You use it and then it's garbage. And that garbage is wasteful for the environment. They try to remove chemicals such as mercury and cadmium from the batteries. And that's not necessarily because they're worried you're gonna eat it and get sick. But when they're disposed of, they're in a landfill, they don't want those chemicals to seep into the groundwater. Just like with lead, it's not really about it affecting you, it's about what happens when it's garbage, basically. And the large size is not good for modern electronics. If you think about when electronics really started becoming small, like in the late 90s, hmm, what did that coincide with? Lithium batteries. Before then, everything, no matter what it was, had to have space for the two AAs or the 9 volt or the 4Ds. That took up a lot of space in electronics and electronics, well, the electronics inside of them are primitive as well, but still the batteries ate up a lot of that volume. Let's do a non-rechargeable battery test. I have a three volt coin cell here and a microcontroller that's going to blink some LEDs. Now this microcontroller can run from anywhere from 2.8 to 5.5 volts. So we can run it off three volts. I have my multimeter set to test current and we do that by switching the leads over and then passing the current through the leads. So the, the multimeter becomes part of the circuit. Let's give it a test. Attach it to power here and power here. Come on, there we go. Okay, it's drawing about 10 milliamps. This particular battery is 220 milliamp hour, which means it could provide 220 milliamps for one hour. So to figure out how long this will last, we take 220, divided by 10 milliamps, and we get 22 hours. But, you know, just be on the safe side, I'm gonna multiply that by 0.8, assuming only 80% efficiency. So about 17.6 hours is a pretty safe bet. We could also increase the voltage by going in series from this battery to this battery, and that will give us six volts total. Let's see what the current draw is at six volts. Okay, it's gone up to about 30 milliamps. Again, 220 divided by 30, 7.3 times 0.8, about 5.8 hours. So at a higher voltage, you lose a lot of your battery capacity because you're draining them faster, basically. Something to think about though, this circuit will keep running until it gets down to about 2.8 volts. So even though you're draining the batteries faster, you're gonna be dropping from six down to three volts. Whereas if the battery is just three volts, it drops from three down to about 2.5, and then your microcontroller will fail. So you have a longer time before it drops out because of that. The other way we can wire up these batteries is in parallel. So the positive leads are tied together and the negative leads are tied together. We're drawing the same current as before, about 10 milliamps. However, since the batteries are in parallel, there will be twice the milliamp hour capacity because they're both being drained. So instead of about 220 milliamp hours, you might have closer to 500 milliamp hours. So in these sort of cases, it's better to put your batteries in parallel to give yourself more current time than it is to put the batteries in series to give yourself a higher voltage. The next type of battery we're going to discuss are standard rechargeable nickel cadmium and nickel metal hydride batteries. These are fairly common in a lot of uh, household items like cordless drill batteries, your standard AA or C or whatever replacement battery that's rechargeable is going to be usually nickel metal hydride. The nickel cadmium ones were older. They were less powerful and they also had cadmium in them, which is not good. Cadmium's pretty bad. You shouldn't even touch it. No. And we were looking for examples in our projects and we really couldn't find any. Yeah, we don't really use these in our projects, except uh, we put these in our labs mm -hmm. and these came out of our, our shop phone, that's about it. Yeah, we burned through lav mic batteries very quickly, so we use rechargeables, so it's better for the environment. And you said you remembered where these came from? Yes, I actually remember. <laughs> these nickel metal hydride batteries were from, I think it was episode seven or eight, the see-through portal t-shirt for Halloween. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, yeah, I think I had like six of these, or either six or eight of these powering the shirt. And since it burned up battery power, I use rechargeables. Yeah, and then you took apart the Xbox 360 battery pack and you found this? Yeah, there's some kind of There's a circuit on, on there. there. Yeah, look at that. It has um, serial clock and serial data, so there's an I squared C device on this. We should try to figure out what it's used for. That'd be cool. Let's go over the nickel cadmium, nickel metal hydride pros and cons. They're cheaper than lithium ion, that's one pro. They require a simpler charging circuit by a long shot. They're the same physical size as alkaline batteries, so you can find direct A, A, C, D replacements. And they provide more power than alkaline, especially in burst, which is good for things like cordless drills. Cons, well this is also a pro, but they're the same bulky size as alkaline, so you don't get the increased form factor choices that you do with the multiple shapes of lithium ion batteries. They self-discharge faster than the lithium ion battery, so if it's going to be sitting around for a while, not being charged, it's gonna go dead faster. And they're not as powerful as lithium ion batteries. So basically, if you don't care about the bulk, but you do care about the price, a nickel cadmium or nickel metal hydride battery can be a good choice. We have this nickel metal hydride battery pack from the Xbox 360. And I think it's curious that there's some sort of integrated circuit on it. So I'm gonna take a look at it. Ah, there's some glue around it. I wonder if there's, oh, I highly doubt there's any charge left on this. I used these battery packs on my Xbox 360 back when I played my Xbox 360. And yeah, if you let them sit, they went dead pretty fast, which is a disadvantage nickel metal hydride has. I don't even know why I'm testing it. Yeah, it's pretty dead. Or flat, as they would say in England. Let's scrape away this stuff and see what we can find out about these chips. This is definitely an I squared C device. If you look on the side here, there are four pins all going to ground. What I squared C devices do is they'll have an internal register like, I don't know, three bits, which would give you seven different addresses. And then you can set the rest of the address by pulling three pins either to high or to low. So this one here would be the ground, of course, and the three above it are also all pulled to low. So whatever its address is, it's basically set to one address. I'm trying to get some text off of it so we can see what it is. It might actually be some sort of security chip, like only authorized battery packs can be used. I'll see if I can get some text off of it and we'll find out more. I've attached the surface mount EEPROM we found inside of the Xbox 360 battery pack to this breadboard in our Arduino. So we should be able to see what's on it. So I'm gonna start the serial monitor, release, reset. Okay, there are the memory contents. Not a whole lot in it, only 512 bytes. Uh, here we can see Xbox battery pack, where it identifies itself. Um, these numbers around it might be some sort of, you know, this is an official battery pack code. And then here near the top of memory, there's a few more numbers. This could be the number of cycles it has been recharged, the temperature, any number of things. Actually, I wouldn't know the temperature because it's not actually connected to anything inside the battery pack. So it's probably just an identifier and a charge counter. We did find one project that uses nickel metal hydride batteries, this Roomba. This is actually for an upcoming project, but there's a quite large nickel metal hydride battery pack inside of it. They probably use this older technology because again, it costs less and also you get a lot of weight out of it. So in this case, it's actually an advantage because the weight helps the robot engage with the carpet and not just kind of like spin its wheels, you know, like a car stuck in the sand. Let's take a closer look at this pack. 14, four volts, 3000 milliamp hours. So what they did here, they put a bunch of batteries in parallel to give it a lot more amperage capacity. And these are obviously the battery terminals. And this right here, if I had to guess, is probably a thermistor, so it can keep track of the battery's temperature while charging. Let's see if there's a resistance on there. 10K, yeah, I could buy that being a thermistor. So, you know, if the batteries get too hot, it can slow down the charging process. Uh, yeah, so anyway, there's a nickel metal hydride battery that'll be used in an upcoming episode.
The next type of battery we are going to talk about are lithium ion and lithium polymer batteries, which are very popular for modern electronics because they have a great size to weight ratio and they come in all sorts of useful sizes like standard cells and flat packs. Yeah, Ben, uh, what's the difference between a lithium ion and a lithium polymer or LiPo? Right, so sometimes they call packs like this just LiPo packs, it's kind of a slang term, but they're not always necessarily lithium ion polymer batteries. Okay. A battery like this is a lithium ion polymer battery, right. and it's a new technology that gives you more power and a higher discharge rate. Uh -huh. This is a quadcopter battery that we use in our little pinball machine, for instance. Because the solenoids, they require a lot of power mm -hmm. and burst, that's why this is good for that. And it also is really good for drills. Drills obviously take a lot of power and then burst. I mean, there's like, sometimes there's like 15 amps at burst. Yeah. Uh, so lithium ion is a good choice for that. I mean, look at this. I mean, this is a nickel cadmium drill battery. Here's a lithium ion drill battery. 20 volts, 18 volts, huge difference. Yeah, it's like twice the weight. Which one would you want to lug around on a job site? Lithium ion and lithium ion polymer, pros and cons. Pros, there's a great power to weight ratio. Get a lot of oomph out of those batteries. And there's a variety of sizes you can make thanks to pouches. So in a slim laptop, for instance, you could have a thicker battery here and then have thinner batteries along the side to form one multi-sized sloping battery unit. Cons, I have a bunch of these listed because with great power comes great responsibility. It requires a more complex charging circuit than other types of rechargeables because you want to charge lithium ion batteries safely. They have dangerous failure states and can actually start on fire. If you think about when you ship something, they might say, oh no, you can't air mail a lithium battery. Or if you're on a flight, they're like, we don't want any loose lithium batteries in checked baggage. And if you think about it, it's kind of ironic because everyone flying probably has an iPhone, a laptop, and those things all have lithium batteries as well, but at least those things are on you or with you. If there are loose batteries, they can slide around, they could potentially get mechanically damaged and fail. They could hit a piece of metal inside your checked bag and short circuit and fail. Or if a battery is not packed properly when it's being shipped, it could short circuit and fail. So those are the possible failure states that they're worried about when they talk about restrictions on lithium batteries and flight. Uh, adding more cells complicates the charging circuit because you have to keep track of the voltage between each of the cells, which is called balancing, to make sure the cells are all charged at the same rate. And as I mentioned, short circuits with lithium batteries are bad. Because they're powerful, that also makes them more dangerous. It's very much like dynamite. So they used to have nitroglycerin, which the Nobel family built, and they would have to transport the nitroglycerin, and it was obviously very, very unstable. So most of his family died creating nitroglycerin. So dynamite was nitroglycerin stabilized in clay, just like a lithium battery, making something very powerful safe. But then when he realized how many people died because of his invention, he felt bad, and therefore he created the Nobel Peace Prize, funded by all of the money he made off of gunpowder and dynamite. Let's look at alkaline batteries versus lithium ion batteries for power. This is a miniature oscilloscope that we're hoping to turn into an oscilloscope watch for a future episode. We've been researching how to power it. We thought about using some coin cell batteries. I mean, that's the most obvious idea, right? But even doubled up with more amperage, they can't run the little microcontroller that's on there. However, a lithium ion battery of the same voltage will work. If you take apart something like an Apple Watch or a Pebble, you will find a very small pouch style lithium ion battery inside. So we'll probably try to find a smaller battery than this, physically smaller, same voltage, and build it into our watch. So alkaline batteries for watches, they're a thing of the past. Of course, in the olden days, your watch didn't have to be charged every day, but still. Here are a couple projects from recent episodes of The Ben Heck Show. This is the Raspberry Pi calculator. And for this, we use two 3.7 volt lithium ion pack cells and we put these in series so we get a total voltage of 7.4 volts. We did this so we can regulate that down to five volts and then power the Raspberry Pi with it. You could probably power the Raspberry Pi with a single one of these 3.7 volt packs, but it wouldn't last as long as this double pack usage. And the packs are nice and flat, making them fit inside of our svelte case. So that's why we use lithium ion in that case, literally. 
Here's our main portable. This also uses the Raspberry Pi A plus module. Here we used two cell type lithium ion batteries and these have a balancer built into them right here which reduces the need for you know, external circuitry. You can basically attach an external charger up to it and it'll work fine. Might have been better to do a flat pack cell in this, but we extended the back of it a little bit to basically hide some of the thickness. And these cells we've used many times on the show, they have a balancer built in, so they are powerful and we know what to expect from them. And they were probably just laying around when we built this thing. The last type of battery we are going to talk about is also one of the first types of batteries, lead acid. So it's called lead acid because that's what it's filled with which also makes it very heavy. But for burst power applications and for price, this really can't be beat. And then you have an uninterruptible power supply that also has these types of batteries mm -hmm. in it. I got one that's got, it's a little bit smaller in this kind mm -hmm. of a different shape, but it's got a, it's an uninterrupted power supply that will keep my uh, computer on for like 30 minutes or so. Right. And then it has a data connection to my computer, so it'll know when the power is out. You also see batteries like this in larger robotics where the weight and the mass of the battery isn't really that important in the grand scheme of the project. Also, with a car, I mean, you know, who cares? I mean, it's a whole car, you got plenty of room. Or a boat, or your uninterruptible power supply just sits under your desk, so mm -hmm. who cares how much space it takes up? Yeah. yeah, so you can get a lot of bang for your buck. Lead acid battery, pros and cons. Pros, there's lots of power, good burst current if you wanna like start up a car or something. They're easy to charge, very simple circuits or you can buy chargers from your local hardware store for a great price, and they're very cheap. Cons, they're very heavy. They have caustic, leakable fluids inside of them, and they're usually quite large. If you wanna trickle charge something, keep it charged all of the time, and then when you do need to use it, have a lot of available current, and you don't care about how much space it takes up, lead acid can be a good choice. They still use them in cars today. A quick overview of all the battery types we talked about in this episode. Alkaline, they're disposable, easy to use, but not super great for the environment. Nickel metal hydride is a rechargeable battery, fairly easy to use, decent power. Uh, doesn't require as complicated a charging circuit as lithium ion does. Also, it's a lot cheaper than lithium ion. Lithium ion, powerful, but trickier to charge. You have to make sure you do it right, otherwise you can have a catastrophic failure. Finally, lead acid batteries, very powerful, great for vehicles and large robots, but heavy, so you don't want to be carrying that around in your pocket. Well, that's all the time we have for today. Be sure to check out element14.com forward slash TBHS for information about other episodes, builds, and special events. We'll see you next time. Cave woman version of Paris Hilton's like, I can't fit this wolf in my purse. Instead of your morning routine of pancakes and eggs and scrambled bacon. <laughs> <laughs> Which would you rather carry around all day? A heavy nickel cadmium battery or a new efficient lightweight lithium ion battery? 20 years from now. What would you rather carry around all day? An ancient lithium ion battery or our new quantum particle battery? 40 years after that, what would you rather carry around all day? A crappy quantum particle battery? or our new free energy astronomical photon transfer technology. Wait, 60 years from now, robots are gonna be building everything, so who cares how much it weighs? <laughs> the Ben Heck Show is brought to you by Element 14, the electronic design community where you can connect and collaborate with top engineers from around the world. Join now at element14.com. <laughs>